Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today we're continuing on with the Great Gish Gallup video called Scientific Evidence for God's Existence, Atheists Should Watch This, Evolution Debunked. Today he's all over the map, starting with dinosaur soft tissue, then shifting to the argument from but there's less people than atoms in the universe, before winding up at abiogenesis. And this is all within 2 minutes and 20 seconds of his video. If you were wondering why I call this series the Great Gish Gallop, that's why. Now on to the video! Interestingly, other things that could only last around 10,000 years are soft tissue, blood cells, and DNA. Yet all these things were recently found in dinosaur bones. This shows that dinosaurs existed thousands of years ago, not 65 million years ago as evolutionists claim. Actually, the types of soft tissue that were preserved were thought to be able to last up to 1 million years before Dr. Schweitzer made her discovery, and with how little of it that was found, it was clearly on the older end of its possible existence. It is worth pointing out at this time that creationists will often exaggerate the amount of soft tissue found. It was literally microscopic. It's not like they cracked the bone open and found a bunch of mush. Small samples of the bone were sent to Dr. Schweitzer for analysis, and it wasn't until the hard minerals were dissolved in a mildly acidic solution that microscopic soft tissue could be seen. In fact, the amount of soft tissue found was so minuscule that laboratory contamination is still something that has not been ruled out as the source of the soft tissue. But assuming the soft tissue is actually from the dinosaur, the iron contained in the dinosaur's blood would have played a critical role in preserving these soft tissues for much longer than originally thought possible. For more detail on the saga of Mary Schweitzer, check out the Stated Clearly video by John Perry on the subject. It's an excellent summary of the events, including explanations as to how iron could play the preservative role, and why the idea that the bone was actually young was the least plausible explanation. And one final point, there was no DNA found, that part is a flat out lie. Another huge problem for evolutionists is the Earth's current human population number of 7.3 billion. Oh goody, the part where you extrapolate current growth rate numbers into the past without accounting for… well, anything really. How long would it take to go from 2 humans to 7.3 billion humans? It actually wouldn't take that long. In recent history, the yearly growth rate average hit its highest mark in 1963 with a growth rate of 2.19%. The world population is currently growing at about 1.14% per year. My god, do you even listen to yourself? You literally just explained how the growth rate can change drastically in a relatively short amount of time, and you're about to assume a constant growth rate to prove a point. This population growth rate argument is one of the absolute worst creationist arguments I have ever heard. But if we started with two humans, how long would it take to reach our current 7.3 billion humans using, say, a 2% yearly growth rate? The answer is that it would only take about 1,100 years. So are you saying that humanity is only 1,100 years old? Because that number doesn't work for either of our views. Obviously, something is terribly wrong here. Like, maybe not accounting for the fact that people need to eat and the amount of food produced will not automatically grow to accommodate a population? but rather the population will shrink to match the amount of food available. Not to mention disease. The plague was a thing, and smallpox. Diseases can wipe out huge numbers of people in short amount of time, and diseases spread faster when there are more people living close to each other. You also used a ridiculously high annual growth rate of 2%. That's almost twice today's growth rate of 1.09%. You even said yourself that the highest growth rate in human history was 2.19% in 1963. That's only 0.19% higher than the growth rate that you assumed for your calculations. How on earth can you expect people hundreds of years ago, without the benefit of modern medicine and agriculture, to maintain a growth rate almost as high as the highest growth rate with modern medicine and agriculture? Since evolutionists believe that we have been on Earth significantly longer than 1100 years, why don't we have a dramatically higher number of people on Earth? Since creationists believe we have been on Earth significantly longer than 1100 years, why don't we have a dramatically higher number of people on Earth? Seriously, if you believe the Flood happened about 4400 years ago, then that means that humanity started expanding 4400 years ago, four times longer than 1100 years. And remember, population growth is exponential, so if we're using a constant rate of 2%, then using the exponential population growth formula, after 4400 years we would expect to see a population of 3.3 times 10 to the 38 people today. Which we don't. And did I mention that that was starting with two people? Start with eight, like you would have after Noah's flood, and that number jumps by an order of magnitude to 1.3 times 10 to the 39. 
Now, that is just slapping one more zero on the end, essentially, which doesn't seem like much, but think of it like this. The difference between having $100,000 in the bank and one million is just one more zero on the end, but that is a huge difference. One number buys you a little tiny house, the other buys you a small mansion. But the difference between just adding a zero is larger every time you do it. It was a $900,000 difference here, but to add another zero to a million to make it 10 million is a $9 million difference. Now keep going until you have 39 zeros, you get the idea. Clearly your estimate of a constant 2% population growth rate is not even close to accurate. Also, where are all the bones or graves considering that almost all people throughout history have buried the dead? Well, considering they find burial sites in Europe almost every time they have to do any major digging, I would suggest that they are everywhere. Remember, bones don't last forever, they can decompose. Not to mention the fact that cremation was a very common method of body disposal, and sometimes the only way we can even tell that we've unearthed human remains is by looking at the urns and other artifacts that would have been buried along with the person. To give you an idea of how common it is to find human remains, here is a map of England with burial sites labeled on it. The red marks are cremation burial sites, and the blue markers are mixed burial sites where some were cremated and others were not. And these are only sites where cremated remains were found, and the burials took place between the mid-5th and early 7th century, so a period spanning about 150 years with a very specific burial method. How many more grave sites were accidentally destroyed without us ever noticing? With how many we actually find, it stands to reason that plenty have also been destroyed, and we were just never aware. And let's not forget that places like Paris exist, which have massive catacombs underneath them. In the case of Paris specifically, there are more than 6 million bodies buried there, and the catacombs were created as a response to the city's overflowing cemeteries. So yeah, everywhere we look, we see dead people, as would be expected. Some may still try to convince themselves that getting an incredibly special planet like Earth was just an accident, in which everything occurred in exactly the right way. There is literally nothing to indicate that the Earth is special, except perhaps for the existence of life. But the only way to find out if life actually is special would be to do a survey of all the planets in at least our galaxy. The fact of the matter is that at this time we have no way of verifying whether or not life is actually special, and all the information so far suggests that there is nothing terribly special about the Earth. If life weren't here, it would just be another rock clump with some water and atmosphere on it orbiting the Sun, very similar to the other rocky planets with the main differences being attributed to its distance from the Sun. Life makes it seem special to us, but for all we know, life could be commonplace in the galaxy. We just don't know, and to assert otherwise is disingenuous. But even if someone believed this, how would life begin on Earth when it is a fact that life can't come from non-life? Is it a fact, though? I mean, it's easy enough to say, but if you put any thought into it whatsoever, it becomes a much more complicated question. To clarify, let's start by defining life. What is life? Life is something that can grow, reproduce, consume, and continually changes before death. Well, by this definition, fire is alive. It can grow, it reproduces itself, it consumes, it always changes, and it will eventually burn out and die. But I don't think anyone actually considers fire to be alive. But what distinguishes it from actual life? Genetic material, maybe? But then the definition of life would be centered around what we know of genetics. It is possible that life has developed somewhere in the universe that does not use DNA or RNA. Would that not qualify as life then, based on this technicality? The fact is that we haven't pinned down an exact definition of what life actually is. At the moment, it's one of those we just know it when we see it types of things, and that doesn't work very well in science. So I don't think we can say for certain that it is a fact that life cannot come from non-life for the simple reason that we don't even know exactly what life is. All living things on Earth are made up of cells, so what are the chances that even a first cell could have accidentally formed? Pretty good, actually. Lipid bilayers can form spontaneously. Our cell membranes are fancy lipid bilayers. Just needs to form around some stuff like a stray bit of RNA and boom, rudimentary cell. About 150 years ago when Charles Darwin was alive, the cell was considered to be something like a simple unsophisticated microscopic blob of jello. As a result of recent discoveries, however, we now know just how amazingly complex these extraordinarily small cells are. Yeah, modern cells are pretty complex. The first cells and protocells would have been much simpler, though. But this is an area of abiogenesis that isn't entirely understood. There are a few different hypotheses about how the first cell developed, including ones where metabolism actually started before these basic cells were encased in the phospholipid bilayer. But I feel like this is a bit outside the scope of your video. Your video is titled Scientific Evidence for God's Existence, 
Even if you demonstrate that all of our current hypotheses about abiogenesis are completely incorrect, that does not prove that a god exists. Hell, it doesn't even do anything to demonstrate that evolution didn't happen. The fact that eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells operate with the same basic molecular mechanisms is excellent evidence that eukaryotes and prokaryotes share a common ancestor, even if we don't know where the first cell came from. But we do have some working ideas. Now, I am no molecular biologist, so at this point I'm just going to read three paragraphs from the second edition of the book The Cell, A Molecular Approach by Jeffrey Cooper. For honesty's sake, I will point out that this book is currently in the 8th edition, so some of this might be outdated, but the 2nd edition is what I had access to in a hurry. Now first, I will summarize the bit that comes before these three paragraphs. Essentially, it's been conclusively demonstrated that organic molecules, including amino acids, can form naturally with no guiding force under the right conditions. That's the first step in this simplified picture of abiogenesis. So, from the book. The next step in evolution was the formation of macromolecules. The monomeric building blocks of macromolecules have been demonstrated to polymerize spontaneously under plausible prebiotic conditions. Heating dry mixtures of amino acids, for example, results in their polymerization to form polypeptides. But the critical characteristic of the macromolecule from which life evolved must have been the ability to replicate itself. Only a macromolecule capable of directing the synthesis of new copies of itself would have been capable of reproduction and further evolution. Of the two major classes of informational macromolecules in present-day cells, nucleic acids and proteins, only the nucleic acids are capable of directing their own self-replication. Nucleic acids can serve as templates for their own synthesis as a result of specific base pairing between complementary nucleotides, figure 1.3. A critical step in understanding molecular evolution was thus reached in the early 1980s when it was discovered in the laboratories of Sid Altman and Tom Cech that RNA is capable of catalyzing a number of chemical reactions including the polymerization of nucleotides. RNA is thus uniquely able to both serve as a template for and to catalyze its own replication. Consequently, RNA is generally believed to have been the initial genetic system, and an early stage of chemical evolution is thought to have been based on self-replicating RNA molecules, a period of evolution known as the RNA world. Ordered interactions between RNA and amino acids then evolved to present-day genetic code, and DNA eventually replaced RNA as the genetic material. The first cell is presumed to have arisen by the enclosure of self-replicating RNA in a membrane composed of phospholipids, figure 1.4. As discussed in detail in the next chapter, phospholipids are the basic components of all present-day biological membranes, including the plasma membranes of both prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. The key characteristic of the phospholipids that form the membranes is that they are amphipathic molecules, meaning that one portion of the molecule is soluble in water and another portion is not. Phospholipids have long water-insoluble, hydrophobic, hydrocarbon chains joined to water-soluble, hydrophilic, head groups that contain phosphate. When placed in water, phospholipids spontaneously aggregate into a bilayer, with their phosphate-containing head groups on the outside in contact with the water, and their hydrocarbon tails in the interior in contact with each other. Such a phospholipid bilayer forms a stable barrier between two aqueous compartments, for example separating the interior of the cell from its external environment. To summarize in simple terms, the building blocks of RNA have been shown to form naturally. RNA can start reactions that cause itself to be copied and can synthesize proteins. Phospholipid bilayers, which make up the membranes for all prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells, can form spontaneously. RNA was at some point enclosed in a phospholipid bilayer, thereby becoming the first basic cell. So we don't know exactly how all of these steps happened, but we know they can happen in the right conditions, and we know that the right conditions could plausibly have existed on Earth about 4 billion years ago. At this point, if you want to invoke God to have put these initial components together to make the first cell, feel free. But be aware that this is simply the God of the gaps. If you are just putting God in where science doesn't have definitive answers, then when science discovers the answers, your God gets smaller. The adult human body contains a hundred trillion cells of various sizes. Ten thousand average size human cells could fit on the head of a pin, and every single cell contains information equivalent to about four thousand books. Yeah, I'm gonna have to disagree there. Here's a video of a guy explaining some basics of genetics, and he's standing beside a bookshelf with an actual human genome printed out in the books. There are about 16 books per shelf there, and about seven and a half shelves are filled, making a grand total of roughly 120 books. Not quite the 4,000 you're claiming. The information for all the cells in one adult in book form would completely fill the Grand Canyon more than 75 times. The Grand Canyon is about 4.17 trillion cubic meters. 
Those books look to be roughly the size of my graphics card box, which is 32 centimeters by 23 centimeters by 7 centimeters for a volume of 0.005152 cubic meters. Pretty big for a book, so I'm comfortable with that estimate. Multiply that volume by how many cells are in the human body, and we get a volume of 192 billion cubic meters. Pretty impressive, but less than 1 20th of the volume of the Grand Canyon. Also, I'm not even sure what you're trying to accomplish with this comparison. If you take something tiny and represent it with something that is literally billions of times larger than it actually is, it fills a really big space. Wow! So what? And it bears mentioning that while all the DNA in book form in your body would indeed fill the Grand Canyon up to 1 20th of its volume, this is just a bunch of copies of the same book. A more efficient system would not have cells in your eyes containing the blueprints for how to build a penis. Had to find some way to force a penis in here. That's what she said. I'm mature, y'all! This cell is similar to a supercomputer, but microscopic in size. Well, that's the first time I've heard that analogy for a cell. Usually it's the brain that's the supercomputer. I wonder where you're going with that, or if you're just going for the wow factor so you can get people to think that it's so complicated that it needs a god. This cell could also be viewed as an amazingly miniature city with an elaborate network of connected assembly lines with numerous molecular protein machines carrying out different tasks which make the cell work. Well, that's nice, but an analogy doesn't actually mean anything. It's just a comparison that is supposed to help you understand how something works. You can come up with clever analogies all day long, and that will still not amount to a single shred of evidence that a god exists. I'm cutting it off here for now as the next part of his video is going to be very research heavy for me. Molecular biology is an area that I'm not yet entirely comfortable in and that's the direction he's headed. So thanks for watching, remember to follow me on Twitter and support me on Patreon. See you next time!